Welcome everyone. Thank you for attending. Very, very excited um, for tonight's programming, all surrounding our rich programming of Epicurean Delights. And as we all know on the call, and if you don't already, Florida Craft Art is a member supported nonprofit organization and we're founded in 1951. So we've been around a while and we will continue with your continued support. As a nonprofit, our mission is to grow the statewide economy by engaging the community and advancing Florida's fine craft artists in their work. Visit Florida Craft Art, because we're open seven days a week, no excuse not to join, and see the constantly changing stream of fine craft created by more than 250 artists. We so appreciate your attendance and as a little reward in addition to the sweet treats that we will be enjoying a little bit later, we will be giving away two gift cards tonight. They will be drawn at the end of the presentation. You must be present to win, not that the chocolate will not entice you to stay, but this will help keep you engaged as well and stick around to the end of the call. In order to bring this programming similar to tonight and all of the wonderful programming that Florida Craft Art offers as part of its exhibitions, we rely on you, our sponsors and our community um, in order to bring this programming free of charge and to enhance our educational programming. Our main sponsor for Epicurean Delights running March 26th through May 8th is Mark Anderson and Keith Bucklew. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Your sponsorship is so appreciated. Along with support from Lisa and Perry Everett, and of course, William Dean Chocolates. The Florida, Fine, uh, the Florida Department of State and the city of St. Petersburg. We hope you will come and see the exhibition. Even if you've seen it virtually, we encourage you to come see it, touch it, live it, um, taste it as we have more than 32 artists and 80 deliciously handmade fine craft objects. And without further ado, to accompany our exhibition, we offer programming appropriate to its theme. Tonight, we will enjoy a very special presentation in chocolate tasting with Bill Brown. Bill began exploring his artistic talents at an early age as he loved to draw. He trained as an educator, but became involved in the dot-com world. He co-founded a software company and later joined an emerging technology company. After watching an episode on the Food Network, he made truffles for his employees as a staff support activity. He later saw the work of artisan chocolatiers and knew he had found the perfect medium to express his creativity. The artistic passion from his youth returned. Artisan chocolates offered a multidimensional palette, the opportunity to create a beautiful outward appearance for the shell with amazing flavor combinations hidden within. He began his journey of learning by reading every book he could get his hands on about chocolate. He then began to take classes and spend time with other chocolatiers to learn even more. Within two years, he learned firsthand from some of the top, top chocolatiers in the world, including Jean-Pierre Weibaugh, Stéphane Glossier, Andrew Schatz, Vincent Pilon, and Ewald Nader. In 2007, he founded William Dean Chocolates and named the company in honor of his father and grandfather. Every piece is made by hand in his shop in Bel Air Bluffs and Tampa, Florida. And speaking of, he will be opening a brand new location, August 1st, located at 3740 Midtown Drive, Suite E100. Of course, check his website for the address right in Tampa Midtown. Each piece excites the eye and, and intrigues the palate with works of art made from only the finest ingredients, which we will learn about right now. Many thanks to Bill for preparing this educational presentation in chocolate tasting and for sponsoring the exhibition. Please join me in welcoming Bill Brown. Bill? Hey, uh, Tyler, thank you for the introduction. And I'll, I'll spice it up a little too. If you wanna add two 20 piece boxes for your drawing, uh, then if people can draw and they can come to the shop, we'll we'll do that as well. So we'll what? put two twenty piece boxes. <laughs> Thank you. How generous. Oh so, um, but uh, yeah, so that way it'll be a little bit different. But you know, thank you for the introduction, and 
Um, excited to, this is a little different, so uh, bear with me. Um, first off, if you've got any questions, um, I guess unmute and ask. We can, we'll probably do a lot after, at the end. Um, when we get to tasting, you may want to have something to drink. Um, I, the best thing, not the best tasting, would be like warm or hot water with maybe a little lemon, but uh, whatever, you, if you got a glass of wine, uh, that's fine too. But uh, when it comes to tasting chocolate, the thing you got to remember is um, it has a lot of, it has a decent amount of fat in the cocoa butter and it kind of coats your mouth. So you want something effervescent. So the best wine to drink is actually a sparkling wine or champagne or Moscato or whatever, um, but also a hot liquid that doesn't have a lot of flavor, whether it's a mild tea or just really warm water with uh, lemon will help to make you salivate and cleanse you. But it'll all taste good anyway. Um, the, the dark chocolate might be harder to tell the difference on, but when we get to some of the specialty chocolates that you don't, you can't get everywhere, um, they're going to come right through no matter what. But um, I thought the first thing we do is kind of go through some, some things about chocolate that you may or may not know and give you a chance to learn some, some facts that you can inflict on your friends and family. Um, it's, uh, and we'll just start with, you know, chocolate is, it's, it's, I think we take it for granted. You go to a store and you see aisle after aisle of chocolate and don't realize how difficult it is to grow the other thing is there's only a finite amount of chocolate in the world. So as China and other countries that maybe before weren't consumers, as they become consumers, there becomes more of a, a tussle for that chocolate because you, you can't really grow a lot more than they're growing now because it can only grow in certain places in the world. It has to be the right conditions, the right, um, you know, it's 30, I think it's 30 degrees uh, north and south of the equator. It needs to have, you know, the right setup. Pretty much you can grow coffee, you can grow chocolate. But anyway, um, I was lucky to visit Costa Rica and learned just how difficult it is. So you, as you can see, uh, it takes about 400 uh, cocoa beans or cacao, same thing, uh, to make one pound of chocolate. It's a long process. And, um, you know, some, some are bigger and smaller. So it, that's just a, a kind of an average. But then when you look below and see that a cacao tree usually does about 2,500 beans, you realize, you know, it's one tree is six, will make six pounds of chocolate. And if you visit a plantation, um, you know, they're typically they're, you know, they're not planted really close to each other. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. But, um, you know, the good thing is, as this slide uh, talks about, you know, chocolate is something you can eat um, and not, uh, it's not too unhealthy. I, I don't ever, I don't want to ever say it's a health food because, you know, I don't know that we're better eating chocolate, but you can make a lot worse choices. Uh, the higher the percentage of cacao, the better, because that just means the lower the percentage of the sugar. So when you see the, the chocolate bars and there's a number, all you have to do is add 100 and subtract that number, and that's how much sugar there is, because a 72% cacao or a chocolate bar means that 28% of that bar is sugar. So that's, if you're watching it for health purposes, that's the best way. Um, and it talks here about how delicate the, the, the trees are. When I was in Costa Rica, they were trying to increase their production, so they planted more trees. The problem was one of the things that uh, affects them is a fungus disease. And all it takes is one tree having it. And if it touches another tree, then they get it. And so they found out, you know, they had to cut down about half the trees because they needed to be far enough apart that these funguses weren't getting transferred by the air from one tree to another. And typically, most, most cacao is pretty much organic and they don't necessarily get certified, but they don't really use pesticides and stuff on it. Um, I know in Madagascar, they said the biggest problem there was the local cows because they would come and rub against the tree and knock the pods down. And a friend of mine was there and he asked, what do you do about that? And they said, we'll tell you later. And that, that night they were eating steak and they said, this is what we do with the cows that can't stay off the trees. But, um, but so it is a delicate product and that has a lot to do with the price. So, um, uh, and again, this is just talking again, cocoa butter is a really interesting fat. It's, I mean, you know, any of the women here know that if you go to, who I usually blame for the high cost of chocolate because cocoa butter is highly sought after by the cosmetic industry because it's, it's really a, uh, an incredible 
fat and it's very, you know, it can be very healthy for you. It can heal your skin. Um, so it, it's actually a, a pretty healthy fat. If you're, you know, when you're talking about fats, you can even cook with it. If you get the, I mean, it'll actually, you can cook uh, just like it's olive oil. You just have to watch that, that, that you don't burn it, but it actually will turn into an oil and you can cook with it. So it's an interesting uh, health uh, uh, object in the chocolate. It's the, it's the cocoa butter where you get your health benefits the most. Um, next slide, Katie. Um, and it's interesting, um, you know, it, it, uh, it's an interesting, if you've never, if you've ever been to a plantation, there, it's interesting, um, it's a, cacao's a little bit like vanilla. If you go there, they all start, a vanilla bean is actually an orchid, and so is the cacao bean. That starts as a miniature orchid. It looks just like a, a, a full-size giant orca, uh, uh, orchid, but it's the size of, you know, your thumb. And it goes from this little flower and turns into this pod that's filled with the um, cacao beans. And uh, again, the it's interesting. The food of the gods is where the the, the tree got its name. Um, however, without sugar, it isn't the most tasty thing in the world. So anybody that's you know bitten into Baker's chocolate knows what chocolate's like without sugar. So it does. Unfortunately, it does need a little help to make it something that we want to eat. Um, originally it was a drink, but, uh, we're just going to run through some of these facts real quick as fast as I can, if you could, Katie, our next slide. Um, and it, it, it's interesting too. It's, it's, it's a very adaptive, um, plant, um, in some ways, um, it, it doesn't do well with disease. I mean, it can't move for, you know, the cows are coming after it, but the leaves actually can move to, you know, which most plants do a little bit, but they can, they can help themselves to be as, as kind of fertile as they can in their location. Um, and so um, they actually, as it says here, you know, they, the trees can be 200 years old. They, they just aren't highly productive for most of that time period. But they're, you know, once they're firmly established, as long as they don't get blight or, you know, fungal disease, they, they last quite a long time and they, um, you know, they're, they're, they're um, again, you see coffee being grown. It's very similar. It's in the same, they really need a canopy of other trees to protect them, but because um, they won't, they won't do well in a direct light as much, but uh, which is why you see most of the cacao in the world is grown in, in certain places in Africa, all, all along the equator, you'll see it where there's rainforest. So, you know, as we lose more of our, our, our tropical and rainforest, it also is going to affect uh, chocolate. So uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, and, you know, most people think of chocolate coming from Europe, which it, it, it's made there, but it's actually grown, and it actually started here in North America, or in South America, actually. And um, it, what has happened is over the years, Africa produces the most. Now, it's not the highest quality. There, we'll get into it in a few minutes. There are um, um, essentially three major types of cacao trees. And the one that's the most hardy, has the highest yield is, is the uh, Forestero, which is grown mostly in Africa. So, you know, pretty much anything from Hershey's, um, maybe even Calibo is probably gonna be grown from, from Africa. And the Ivory Coast is, is actually the biggest single producer of any country. Um, and, and most of the farms, it's family. Um, which has caused some problems if you're, you know, we're all wanting to be careful. And uh, a lot of times it's tough on a company that's trying not to have uh, um, free trade because like in Africa, the whole family works there. So when the kids are young, they're out working. So it can kind of be a little challenging because it's, it's kind of crossing the scope of, you know, having laborers who are under 16, they're part of the family. Um, it's like me, I'm from Kansas. We didn't, I didn't grow up on a farm, but technically a lot of your corn is not free trade because the kids that are growing up on the farm are actually doing a lot of the farming. Uh, but Valrona, who we, we use in most chocolate companies, try to really work with reputable plantations. But they're mostly small farms, families that have had them for generations. And again, here you can see the, the, the vast majority of the chocolate in the world comes out of Africa at this point. And then again, this is uh, uh, the Ivory Coast, which is the biggest producer. 
Um, and again, yeah, it takes it takes some time. So you've got to get the tree established. It takes at least you know usually four to five years. Um, I was in Costa Rica three or four years ago and was able to plant a tree. And uh, I'm sure they're not going to give me any of it, but I'd lo love to see what, how it's doing today. Um, when it says it takes two to four days, that's just because of the process. It's uh, uh, and that's there's just a lot of steps. I don't break them all down here, but there's at the plantation they will dry and ferment the beans and uh, um, then they will typically then Europe will get them and they roast them and they process the beans and turn it into chocolate. But the, the farmers themselves have to do the, the uh, drying and fermentation of the beans. And if it's not done correctly, it won't be good chocolate. So they're very good at what they do. And again, the cocoa percentage, um, that's the number. That's what the number means. It means if you see 65%, what it really means is you're eating 65% of what was growing on the tree at one point. And that's going to be two things, cocoa butter, which is the fat, and then cocoa solids, which is like, you know, like what we see with like uh, cocoa powder. Uh, and again, it's just interesting. If you look back in history, even at, in, you know, fairly long ago, it was already making um, a splash, you know, in the U.S. especially and, and, and also Great Britain. Uh, but you'll find out later, we think we're chocolate eaters, we don't hold a candle to Europe. Um, and again, a lot of the, those 40 to 50 million people that depend on cocoa, most of them are, are pretty poor. I mean, they're the farmers and they're, there's a lot of uh, uh, cocoa producers today that are trying to give back more money to the farmers because they, in the past, it's been a commodity that's bought low and then sold high for the end producers and they're trying to be a little more fair. Uh, Felkland, a Swiss company I've worked with, is really good about that. They always pay, I think it's 25% above market for the beans. Uh, again, early on, especially in, the, in Central America, it was highly valued and it was a, it was a drink. It was drank as a, I believe it means bitter water is the, in the Aztec, I think it's an Aztec language, whatever that was. It actually meant bitter water. It was like a little bit like coffee. It was drank as a, as a liquid. And when it first went back to Europe, the good thing about it was it was so strong that you've heard of the term death by chocolate. And there's, there's a restaurant that claims they came up with it with the dessert, but it was also used a lot to mask poisons back in Europe. So when it first went back, you know, in the 1500s or whatever, uh, if you were a noble person, you could easily get poisoned and you would not be able to detect it if it was put into a chocolate drink, which the wealthier are the ones that really wanted. And you can see, I don't know how, Montezuma, Montezuma drank 50 cups of cacao a day. I couldn't drink that much water. Um, I can't imagine that was healthy, but um, again, it was, it was highly uh, sought after. And then you can see the, the Spanish. And it's the Spanish, really, for anybody that really likes chocolate. Um, we always give the French credit, and they are tremendous chefs, and, I, and that's who I've studied with. But it's the Spanish who really came up with chocolate. They brought it back from the New World to Europe, and they're the ones that even today are usually kind of the for you know at the forefront of innovation with chocolate. So, if you like, uh, if you go to restaurants that are really big into uh, molecular gastronomy, that's all Spanish. I mean, even savory side, that's pretty much the Spanish that are driving that. So, give them a little credit because I don't think they get it. Okay, and some quick trivia here. Again, Napoleon. Um, it was one of those things where he had certain things that no matter where he was, probably, I don't know if when he was in Russia freezing to death and people were dying, he still had his wine and chocolate, but it was something he made sure was supplied. And, and he was really, um, as a military leader, really good at supply chain. So chocolate pretty much followed him everywhere. Uh, this is just, uh, I don't know what it means, but uh, I've seen these molds for, for a long time. These are old metal molds. And uh, for some reason, that you get a chocolate fish in France for April Fools. Don't know why. I just saw it. So, uh, there's this is something too. German chocolate cake I grew up with, and I thought, oh, it's some kind of German recipe or whatever. Had nothing to do with that. The guy's name was Sam German, and he wasn't German. Um, and he used uh, Baker's chocolate for it, which we'll find a little more about here. Baker's chocolate doesn't mean it's for baking. That was just the name of the founder. But if you've ever eaten it by itself, you know it's not for just eating. Although I've had a few customers tell me they like to just snack on it, which I don't understand. It basically, honestly, without sugar, it's to me like eating dirt. But 
if you like it, good for you. It's healthy. You can eat as much as you want, probably. And again, these are, I, I give Cadbury all sorts of credit for coming up with chocolate. I don't know how to eat that thing. I've tried it before. It's just too sweet. Um, they're hugely popular in the United Kingdom, though. Um, and, and Cadbury chocolate overall is really popular, and, and they do a good job. And I know a lot of Americans that love to go, to go to England especially, they'll come back with Cadbury. Um, and this is just something that we don't always know what our food really is, but, you know, it said earlier it was a fruit tree, but, um, you know, this is just kind of looking a little closer. It's basically, it's really more of a vegetable, uh, not really how you eat it, but, uh, you know, it's, I, I don't even know that I classify chocolate as a fruit, but, you know, it really is from a, the vegetable, uh, a tree that comes from more of the vegetable line. Uh, this is the, I hear this debate all the time from people, why chocolate's not chocolate. Um, but it really is. Um, in America, we have a lot of white chocolate that isn't white. You, isn't, you can't use the term chocolate unless you have at least, I think it's 20% cocoa butter. And, and of course the milk solids. Uh, in America, there's a big push to use coconut oil and palm kernel oil. Um, and it's really just for cost. Um, but white chocolate is actually, it is chocolate. It only has the cocoa butter though. So it doesn't have any of the the roasted cocoa solids that give us that flavor we know so well, but it's actually the most expensive chocolate typically because it has so much cocoa butter in it. It usually has as much or more than milk and dark chocolate. Plus it has milk fat, which is also expensive. So uh, it is chocolate, but uh, it is sweet. And again, this is the way it was first enjoyed was hot chocolate. And it's still um, really a good way to do it. It's tough in Florida. I mean, honestly, we make it. Uh, but, you know, come July, the last thing I want to drink is a hot cup of chocolate because it's, it's delicious, but it just coats your whole mouth. You know, it's so rich in, in fat. Um, and I thought this was interesting, too. I didn't realize this. It's basically the only thing that melts at the temperature it melts at, which is one thing, one reason I think our palates like it so much. You know, the whole m and melts melt in your mouth, not in your hand. Um, so, the melting point has a lot to do with why you like chocolate though, because it melts easily in your mouth. If you use palm kernel oil or coconut oil, they melt over our body temperature, which means a lot of people say it tastes waxy. It's because that fat never leaves your mouth. Cocoa butter, you can digest. Your body will melt it and it will go down. If you eat a big candy bar, yeah, it's gonna taste like chocolate for a while, but it will actually digest. Whereas, you know, really some of those other fats um, our body doesn't really melt them. It takes a while to get that flavor out. And these are the beans where, you know, there's a lot of different cacao trees and beans. Um, there's basically three today. There's a fourth one that's becoming popular. Um, it's really a form of Criollo. Criollo is the best tree you can make. And you, you know, you might wonder why don't they just grow those? Because you can't. They have to be in the right place. It has to be the right conditions. They produce the best beans, but they have the smallest yield and they're not very hardy. So they also are very susceptible. The best places you get these are typically Venezuela, Madagascar. I mean, there's only a few places in the world. Um, it's like usually five to 7% of the world's production is what I see, um, but it is the best tasting, but you know, the cost is also very high and there's a lot of competition for the best beans. Uh, the next one, the forest arrow is again, a natural growing tree and it's very hardy. Um, it produces very easily, um, and again, high yield, but it just doesn't have quite the um, refined flavor, the beans. I mean, it makes chocolate. It's got a good chocolatey flavor. You can roast it and get, a, you know, what people think is chocolate. You just don't get those nuances. Like when we taste some of these chocolates tonight, there'll be Criollos, there'll be Trinitarios. So you're going to be able to taste this, um, the, the tree and what it gives us over just, you know, this base beans. The Trinitario, again, was an accidental, accidental uh, cross uh, fertilization. So it's, it's a hybrid of the two trees. And the great thing is it, it takes the best of both. So it has, uh, it's hardier than the Criollo, has a better yield, um, but, uh, you know, um, so it, it's, it's used a lot, but again, it's, um, it's still fairly hard to grow compared to the Forestera, which is in Africa, most all the trees in Africa on the continent of Africa are gonna be forest arrow. Madagascar is its own special world and we'll taste some of their stuff. 
they have some of the best stuff in the world. Very unusual. When you taste it, so if you if we have any wine connoisseurs, there's a lot in common between chocolate and wine. Um, when you look at the ingredients on chocolate, on most of them, um, there's no additives like for flavor. It's the soil that really determines the flavor. And so if it's a highly acidic floil, volcanic, you're going to get a, a more acidic or fruity flavor. And then you know, all the other things that come into play with anything, you know, the temperature, the sunshine, the rainfall, has it been, you know, has it been a good year? Also, did they ferment them properly and dry them? Uh, if they, if they don't, if they don't do it right, they usually get tossed, but if they're not done as well, it also doesn't get the bean to kind of its full, full uh, uh, effect. And roasting is just done, it's like they, they used to use coffee roasters. It's pretty much the same thing. Uh, they have special roasters today, so they don't burn the beans. And this is where, you know, we think we're big chocolate eaters. And then you look at like Switzerland and Germany and you realize, you know, actually even France is way down there. Um, and, and we do eat a lot. I mean, you don't see China on the list. They're probably a pound, but they're starting to eat more uh, in India. And um, it's a great thing for people who, who make chocolate. But like I said, it's going to have an impact on the cost because, you know, the pool of chocolate is only as big as it is. You can make maybe a little more, but you can't like just start growing it in, you know, Kansas, it won't work. There's only one state in the United States that can actually produce decent chocolate and that's Hawaii. Um, it's the, uh, the Dole Plantation has some really interesting chocolate, but when you see this and realize that Switzerland needs twice as much chocolate as we do, that's pretty amazing. They love it. And this was something I thought was interesting that, um, there's probably a lot more to this too, like levels of education, but they, for some reason, they came up with this explanation that uh, the countries that ate the most chocolate also won the most noble uh, prizes per person. So I guess it's a good excuse if you like chocolate and you want somebody to get you, get you uh, more chocolate. But uh, um, it also, if you look, the countries have a lot of other similarities, but somebody put this together and uh, you know, Switzerland is way up there. So just interesting fact. So now we'll get to the fun part, the chocolate tasting. And uh, again, have some scissors. Uh, we'll go ahead and move forward. And what you're gonna wanna start with is the, the dark chocolate. There's like six pieces. And we're gonna start with the one that says extra bitter. Go ahead and pop it out. Usually the best way to eat it is to snap it in half. Um, you can wait a second. If you put it in your mouth, don't worry. Uh, you wanna kind of let it start to melt and then kind of put it to the roof of your mouth or whatever. Um, this is a workhorse chocolate from Valrona. So while they don't say it has four sterile beans, I'm sure it does. Well, it's, it's a blend of many different beans, but its whole purpose is to have a chocolatey, you know, bitter flavor to it. Um, so go ahead and try it. And I'm going to be with you. We use this a lot in our machines. We usually blend it with something else, but it's a, um, again, it's a good chocolate flavor. The reason we use this if when we make something that's unusual on the inside, I don't want to have it compete with the flavor on the outside. So if I make, um, you know, one of our chocolates, like um, maybe our coconut caramel or something, I don't want the outside of the bean or the, the shell that we make to have a really nice flavor that doesn't balance with the coconut. So this is a great flavor to use when you're just wanting a nice chocolatey flavor, good for baking as well. The 61% here, you can see it broken down. So it's 37% uh, sugar, so I'm a little off, but typically it's almost exactly up to 100. Um, and uh, the fat, 39%. The only fat in here is cocoa butter. When it's dark chocolate, there's no other fat. All the fat is cocoa butter. Um, so milk chocolate, white chocolate, it's a little more confusing because you got milk fat, but uh, again, the, the advantage here is you've got fairly low sugar. The fat you're eating is a good fat. It's better than in palm kernel oil. Um, if it has the word chocolate anywhere, it can't, it has to be cocoa butter. This is kind of the, this is like my car. This is a Honda. It's, it's, it, it gets you where you're going. It's, it's well done, but it's not nuanced. Now we're gonna go to the next one, which is Ilanka, one of my favorites. Uh, it's new. Single origin means it's all farmed from the same plantation in Peru. So Ilanka is a 63%. Go ahead and try it. It's um, much more balanced. Um, 
has a little more subtlety to the flavor. Um, it's fruity, but not overly fruity. But um, my chocolatier friends, it seems like this is almost everybody's favorite. It'll have a little lasting finish on your palate more than the other one did, um, but not overly. It's, it's, a, it's a nice flavor. To me, it's chocolatey, but this is where, so this wouldn't be a great chocolate to use on the outside for a shell because it would compete with the flavor I did on the inside. Our ganaches are designed, you know, we're trying to show off that flavor, whether it's raspberry or whatever. We do use this with some, like it's actually good with raspberry. So when we make a raspberry ganache, we might use a lanka with the raspberry uh, puree. But on the outside shell, we usually go with a straight chocolate. But this is, again, one of my favorites. When Valrona names a chocolate, they typically try to kind of pay homage to the to the local people. So this is this is from, um, I don't have my glasses, so it's hard to read. But uh, they chose um, Ilanka, which means, uh, from the local language, Isla means the light, and then um, Anka is condor. So Peru, condor, you know, so it's, it's one of their newer ones. Uh, pretty expensive. You probably won't see, you will, probably can't buy this, but um, uh, we have it here. We use it a lot. Tenori. So this comes from the Dominican Republic. Again, it's a single origin. So it's most likely going to be a Trinitario bean. Um, it could be, uh, I don't think it's Criollo. I don't think it's Forstero. This is going to have a little bit different flavor. Uh, so go ahead and try it. I find most of the ones in the Caribbean and uh, Central America tend to be, um, have a little stronger flavor for me. This one's actually pretty good. And again, kind of take notes. I mean, they're all different. And remember the flavor, the difference isn't because they've added anything. It's really the soil and the location. And again, it's a nice chocolate. Now we're into something different. Manjari comes from Madagascar. Um, for Valrona, this is their favorite chocolate. It's not mine, but it's, it's, it's interesting. Go ahead and try it. Uh, Madagascar has some of the most unusual soil in the world. And if your mouth is getting overloaded, drink something, rinse your mouth out. This will come through no matter what, though. So Manjari is very fruity, very acidic. Anything we do with raspberry, this is what's, what we use. It also bakes really well. And this is probably one of Valrona's two or three most popular chocolates. If you go to a Four Seasons anywhere, you're going to get Manjari because they've convinced all the pastry chefs in the world it's the best one. Um, so if, if you like it, the reason I put this in, if you like it, and you're at a, a shop that has 100 bars, and you see one that says fruity or acidic, then if you like Manjari, that's a bar for you to try. Um, I would probably, I'm going to drink something here because I find it um, still on my palate. It, it has a lingering effect and um, which isn't a bad thing, but when trying to go, when you're going down a step, it's um, tough. So this is Alpaco. Again, this is a fairly new one and um, it, um, it's, well, it's listed as 67%, but it's 66% cacao. So you're getting a little, little less sugar. Um, if you see the fat, 39%, it has more cocoa butter. So for me, it's more fluid. So if we're, if we're making shells, the higher the cocoa butter percentage, the more fluid the chocolate is, the shinier it'll be when it, when it uh, um, hardens. This is one I like a lot. I mean, it's a little bit like wine tasting. Sometimes I don't understand, you know, they have all these, these flavors and, you know, like this, you know, well, this one's not bad. Sweet spices. I don't get that dried fruit. I think it's a very balanced chocolatey flavor. I like the, the way it ends on my palate. Um, but, you know, it, it, like with wine, I never get when they talk about, you know, all the flavors and then like essence of sadness or whatever. I mean, to me, it just, this has a chocolate flavor. Um, I like it. It has a nice, um, at the very end, it, it kind of leaves your palate, but it, it, it's not, it's not, it's not nearly as acidic as the one we had before. Okay. And the next one is one of my favorites. Uh, so this is a, a, a Grand Cru blend, meaning it's a blend of, of beans. They're from all over the Caribbean. So it changes, 
but they roast them and they process them to get the same flavor profile. So Karib, this is what we usually mix to elevate our base chocolate with extra bitter. I just think it has a great, really balanced flavor to it. And again, remember, it's not like other foods where you can say, like it says down below, you know, what you compare it with. They're not adding lemongrass or anything to it. It's just the flavor they're getting from the natural bean. I find this to be one of the most balanced flavors of all. Um, and again, it's a higher percentage. It's, it's certainly not as bitter as a lot of the other ones. Okay, so now we're going into the secret stuff that you can't buy. Um, the first one's Canareva. It's a milk chocolate. It's again from Madagascar. So it carries all sorts of unusual flavors. This one I use a lot with uh, coffee because I think it, ha it has milk powder. That's the only thing they've added, but it really has a different flavor. A lot of people think it's really popular in Great Britain because it has kind of toffee flavors and caramel flavors. And it's all from the bean. I mean, and the milk, the milk helps, but it's just, it's the same milk fat that they use in other chocolates. Like the next one we're gonna try is gonna be a, a milk chocolate made with milk fat, made with beans, but very different. So um, the Tanariva one is very interesting. I like this with coffee. Um, when we make a coffee ganache, I think it just adds kind of a little depth of flavor. You might want to take a drink. <laughs> now this next one will be everybody's favorite, most likely. Um, Valrona, so the French aren't always the, they're wonderful at food, but they're not always the most creative in my mind because they love to do um, things the way they've always been done. And Stefan Glossier, one of the guys that I, met, I studied with, told me something that was really good. He said, you know, in America, everybody's always wanting to do something new, something different. But in France, we talk about the things we've forgotten how to do. So art's probably kind of the same way. You gotta, you know, you wanna forge ahead, but don't forget the people that came before that had great technique and, and knew what to do. So, you know, Pat de Fouy, which is a fruit jelly, which I love, is hundreds of years old and some people don't make it uh, anymore or know how to make it. And uh, so while we wanna be creative, we also wanna honor kind of the, the things that people have done for many years. But this is the milk chocolate most people love. The only thing different about this is the sugar they use is caramelized sugar. So I'll go ahead and try it. Same, almost the same, very similar makeup to the last one, mm -hmm. as far as sugar or milk. A very different flavor and we blend this with our milk chocolate just to add those caramel notes it's very it's a it's very sweet for me um so that's why i don't use it all the time but when we make a caramel a lot of times we want to we don't want to just do the caramel we like to add a little chocolate because the cocoa butter and the chocolate give flavor to it this is a really good one to use at the very end of a, a, a caramel because it has all the same flavors that you've worked so hard to create by you know, melting the sugar. Um, but this tends to be a very popular one. Um, and again, the only thing they did different here was they caramelized sugar and uh, then you know put it back into a sugary form and, and used it that way. But it's, I think it's a really interesting one. Okay, so the next one, this is uh, Kitavoa. This is really unusual. Um, so when you pick uh, cacao, they split open the pod. It's got this milky covering around the, the beans, which they use they, they use to ferment. They put like banana leaves or whatever, ferment for a couple of days. Now I came up with the idea of doing a double fermentation. So they fermented the beans, not all the way. Then they brought banana puree and poured banana puree over the beans. So try this. There's no banana, banana added to the flavor but they fermented it in banana puree. So it brings naturally a little bit of a banana flavor and it's a milk chocolate. So it's a very, there, there is no banana actually in it though. The only flavor it's getting is during the fermentation process, the beans picked up that banana puree kind of uh, essence and uh, then they roasted them and all that. So um, I find it very interesting. I mean, they're, the only country in the world that I know, or the company in the world that's done this, they did it with banana and they did it with uh, passion fruit. The passion fruit one's actually better, but I find I find it a very interesting chocolate and I kind of applaud them for doing something different. Um, now we'll go to the next one, which uh, Ivoire, 
So Opali is the second white chocolate that, uh, so this is Ivoire is Valrhona's famous white chocolate. And uh, about 10 years ago, I said, I wanted to get another custom chocolate and I wanted it to be white. And they were offended because they said, Ivoire is the best white chocolate in the world. Why would you want anything different? Well, I wanted something that was a lower cocoa butter percentage. So just to explain, so when we shell, 35% means 35% cocoa butter. It makes the chocolate very thin. So when we mold our chocolates, we have a hard time getting the right thickness on the mold. So I said, I want a 33% and I want it to have a lot more milk fat flavor. And they created Opaly, which is what you're trying right now. Um, after being first insulted by me, even asking for it, and then they sent it to me and I tried it and it was too expensive. So I said, no, forget it. And then about eight months later, Opaly hit the market. So they've never given me official credit for it, but I just told the guy today, it's going to be on my tombstone because they would not admit an American told them what to do. But Opaly is a 33% white chocolate. Ivoire was the only white chocolate for almost the entire uh, time that uh, Valrhona has been in business. And I'm sure they sat around tasting it. This has a very milky flavor. And the 33% cocoa butter means when we do our shells, we get just thick enough shell um, to make it work. And when I take a, say a shell, think of like an ice cube, the old style ice cube where you filled it with water. And if, if you turn it upside down before it was completely frozen, the outside would form ice first. Well, our chocolate molds are the same way. They look almost the same. We fill them with chocolate. We wait a minute, turn them upside down, and the chocolate's already started to crystallize. So we get that's how we get our shells on the outside. And 35% uh, takes longer to crystallize, super thin, doesn't come out. So we, we switched it. But uh, Opaly is what you just tried. Um, white chocolate sweet. Some people love it. I think it's got its place. Now, this is another really good one. And this was... Uh, Valrona, this is actually, this is actually a voile. Uh, while this is a white chocolate. When it says blonde, it's really white chocolate. What happened in France, an intern was working for Valrona, and they told, they had some white chocolate that was getting close to out of date, date, excuse me. So they thought, why don't we melt it? They thought that would do something, I don't know what. Well, he forgot about it. And then all of a sudden they could smell it. And of course they were calling, you know, they told me stupid and yelling at him. And then Frederick Bao, who's the head guy, is like, well, that smells pretty good. So they lowered the temperature and they kept cooking it. So that's what this is. This is white chocolate that's been caramelized in the oven. And what it does, like dolce de leche, it caramelizes the sugar and the milk fat. So it gives a totally different depth of flavor. So if you say you don't like white chocolate, understand this is white chocolate that you're actually eating. They're trying to call it blonde chocolate because then they can market it differently. But... Um, I think it's a great flavor, um, and it's one of our most popular chocolates. Um, we coat it with dark chocolate because it's very sweet. So by coating it with dark chocolate, we kind of bring down the sweetness a little bit, try to balance it better. But this is a classic mistake that turned into a good product. So it's it's pretty interesting. We would not have this if that poor intern who probably got fired hadn't burned uh, the chocolate. Uh, now we're going to go to the uh, black market stuff here. So Valrona was trying to come up with some new ideas. White chocolate, people say it's not chocolate because it's just cocoa butter with milk fat. And they started thinking, well, what if we take cocoa butter instead of milk fat, we use fruit powder. So they thought they tried. So this isn't officially chocolate yet. It can't be called chocolate because it doesn't, even though it has the same amount of cocoa butter as white chocolate, they don't know. So it's called inspiration, but if you like passion fruit, um, that's what this is. It's, it's cocoa butter with passion fruit powder and sugar. And go ahead and try it. Very intense flavor. And for me, the beauty of it is we use passion fruit juice all the time. And I can make a ganache with it. But because it has water or milk, it has a shelf life. But with this, my new thing now is I, I take jelly bellies. And I take mango jelly bellies and I coat them with this passion fruit. This can be good for six months. There's no, I mean, it's not, it's shelf stable essentially for, you know, about six months because with, um, it won't go bad. It won't go rancid or anything like that, but the fruit powder starts to dissipate, but it's really, um, it is an innovative 
thing that they've done. And if, if you don't like passion fruit, I apologize because it's pretty intense. But I love passion fruit and it's just got a great flavor and it just opens doors for people who are creative to do different things. I mean, I know some people use it to make ganache. I can use passion fruit to do that. What I like to use it for is in our new store, we're going to have a bakery and we're going to do beautiful eclairs and, and glazes on desserts. Well, we can use this to create a glaze that on an eclair that before, you know, you get chocolate, you basically a chocolate eclair. We'll be able to do a passion fruit one. That's the one we just tried. So you can see the cocoa butter percentage is about the same. There's a little fat. It looks like, I guess, technically maybe in the, I don't think so, but they have it listed as 1% of fat. Um, but it's very similar to white chocolate and it's makeup, except it has no milk. There's no milk at all in it. It's all fruit, sugar, a little bit of sugar, like 66%. And, uh, um, and you can see it has very little passion fruit powder because it's so intense. This is my favorite inspiration, raspberry. From So this, if you like raspberry gelato, that's what I think this tastes like. And what's great for this is, you know, one of the things I want to do is make um, our brownies. We make called Bouchons. Usually it has chocolate chips in it. I'm thinking raspberry and chocolate are excellent together. So we can put raspberry chips in cookies or something else. And it has such a, a robust raspberry flavor. And again, you know, for glazes or frostings or whatever, um, it's really it's really something. Valrhona, I don't know if they've patented this or whatever, but it's a really interesting process they have. Other people are show. I can do it now because I know how to do it. And other chocolate companies are telling people how to do it. But Valrhona is the only one who's actually selling it. And they have strawberry. They also have um, yuzu, which is incredible. It's a Japanese fruit. It's the most expensive chocolate you can buy. I think I pay $18 a pound, and I'm paying way less than anybody pays for Valrhona. I think it's over $50 a pound if you tried to buy it online. Uh, this one's probably $30 or $40 a pound if you tried to get it online, if you can find it. Very few chocolatiers actually can get access to it right now still. But anyway, let's go to the next one. I think we're about there. Um, we are. So, I mean, it, uh, you know, any questions? I mean, thanks for bearing with me. And it's a little odd doing it with no reactions. But uh, uh, let's go ahead and, you know, open up. Anybody has any kind of questions about the chocolates, about anything else? I'll just start, Bill, by saying yummy. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I'd like to say first that these are pictures of this present shop at Bel Air Bluffs. And then it, this is a picture on the right of his new shop that's opening up in Tampa Midtown. That's and beautiful. And we just appreciate we so much look? that Bill has, he's so yeah. busy opening this new shop, but yet he took the time to do this for us to accompany our show, Epicurean Delight. So we really appreciate that. Okay. So now should we open it to questions? Hey, Bill, I, have a, I have a question, um, which is more of a, a suggestion. Okay. Maybe open up a shop in downtown St. Pete. <laughs> you, know you read my mind. <laughs> you, you can blame Tampa Midtown. We were in the process of a, we had a spot picked on Central, um, right in, uh, what's the new place? Grand Central? Is that? Um, yeah. So we had a building that uh, we were going to do, and we were going to do a restaurant. It had outside seating. We were getting close to maybe discussing and signing a lease. And then I got a call from the developers of Tampa Midtown. And it's, for those that don't know, it's the largest project in Tampa in 25 to 30 years. Or it's one of mm -hmm. the largest. It's a whole city block from mm -hmm. Dale, right up Dale Mabry and 275. So, that, you know, the crossroads of two busiest streets. And it's it's a city within a city. There's 400 luxury apartments. There's two hotels. Chris Pont's opening his flagship restaurant. Uh, the largest Whole Foods in the Southeast. Shake Shack. Oprah has a restaurant that's going in. So it's just this incredible space. And they called me on a Sunday when I was looking at St. Pete and said, hey, we really want you for this spot. And I, I, was, I started to try to negotiate. He said, no, no, no. You don't have to sell us. We want you. We've had your stuff. And Chris Pont has 
raved about you. So, um, so we walked away from St. Pete, not because we don't love St. Pete, but um, I still believe this is really, and I, and St. Pete has been just a um, juggernaut over the last 10 years or 15 years. And I hope we do plan on going there. And if anybody's from the Wesley Chapel area, um, I had always ignored it, even though um, my customers kept telling me not to. And then I, at Christmas, I offered to do a delivery. It said Tampa. Uh, a lady bought like $1,000 worth of chocolates for her family. And I was like, it couldn't make it there in time. So I said, okay, I'll just drive it over because it said Tampa, which I didn't realize Wesley Chapel is South Georgia. Um, <laughs> it took me about almost an hour to get there. And I thought, there's no way if you live there that I would expect to see you in our shop very often. And it's just a really nice area. So things go right. I think Wesley Chapel and St. Pete would be, both be locations. We'd like to have a shop in the future. And this new shop's doing a lot of things that we don't do now. So we're going to do croissants. We're going to do sandwiches, salads. Um, we're going to try to really elevate some of the food, some stuff that people have not seen in Tampa. So the eclairs we're going to do will be like our chocolates. They're going to be hopefully very tasty, but they're going to be beautiful as well. So we're going to, um, you know, we're in a great location because there's, like I said, I think 400 apartments there. There's two hotels, neither of which have a, a restaurant. So they're pushing people to go to the local places. If you get a chance, um, you should drive by. REI is now open, which I, I'm not healthy enough to know what REI is, but it's, a, it's kind of the, um, right, the upscale health, uh, the up, upscale sporting goods store. If you, you know, I think it's mostly younger people wanting to buy kayaks and stuff like that, but it's a cool store. They built a lake next to it so that you can, they, they can rent kayaks and go out on the little lake. Um, and they're opening the hall at Midtown, which will be basically six to eight different, uh, I think restaurant tours that will have their offerings in a single setting where, you know, you sit at a table and if you want, Mexican food and your friend wants Italian, you can do it. Anyway, go ahead. Sorry. But we will be in St. Pete someday, I promise. I guess I'll have to order online then. Uh, <laughs> I guess well, I'll have to order online. <laughs> we we were very close. I can tell you that. I mean, I love the building. We were going to actually do a restaurant and do because it had enough space. And I, I, I just hired a guy to run my kitchen. He's a savory chef. So mm. um, we'll be there someday. What other questions for Bill do we have from the from the crowd? Any others? For questions? If not, we'll get ready to do the drawing. Oh, I just have a real quick question. How many people make your chocolates? Um, right now, I mean, COVID's been interesting. So we, um, you know, we've been fortunate. I mean, not everybody in the food industry has been uh, because we ship, um, you know, we we took a big hit like everybody did and then our internet sales went up so we right now have one two three uh, we have four people making the chocolates plus somebody else who does our gelato and our confections that's probably going to double with the new shop um, we're building a kitchen so right now we have our store bel air bluffs we're building the store in tampa and right in between we're building a production kitchen where we will do all of our production. We'll do classes there. We'll do events there. Um, so, you know, occasionally we do events where we cook savory food. People come in, they make chocolate bars. Um, it's going to be a perfect location for that. And it's, it's right near the uh, St. Uh, Clearwater Airport. So it's kind of right between the two shops. I have a question. Yes. Hi, Bill. Um, I uh, am so excited because we're three blocks away from Midtown. <laughs> I've been here 20 years and I bought this house uh, 21 years ago that all the developers said, you wait, there's this big, really cool place that's going to be built any minute. It was 21 years ago. So I'm um, glad I live long enough to see this happen. I wanted to ask if you were going to have any vegan um, options. I'm sure we will. Uh, the challenge... The challenge with some of the vegan stuff is, well, no, we'll definitely have vegan. Um, uh, the challenge sometimes with organic is that you have to get certified organic. Like I said, almost all chocolate is organic, except maybe the sugar. We will definitely have vegan. When it comes to our gelato, our sorbets are going to be vegan. 
we do afternoon teas as well, which are very popular. Our grapefruit sorbet is really, really good. So that's one something you could. Wonderful. Yeah. So we'll have we'll have twelve different sorbets and gelatos every day there, um, sandwiches and salads. So we, yeah, we'll have some options. We really appreciate Bill the time, all the effort that you went through on this presentation. We've learned so much, and we appreciate your sponsorship of, of it, and also uh, Mark Anderson and Keith Buckley sponsoring it, Harry and Lisa Everett, and um, it, it, we, we can't manage to do these exhibitions and the programming free of charge for the public without sponsorship. So thank you. Well, you're uh, very welcome, and don't forget the 20-piece boxes. That's right. Okay. So we have two twenty dollars gift cards, and then yeah. Bill has Bill has offered two of the twenty piece boxes, and it looks like we've had quite the uh, attendance, and people have stayed on. I have the names that we've drawn out of the bowl for the the winners, and for the twenty dollars gift card to Florida Craft Art, and you just have to come in, you know, to pick it up at Florida Craft Art is Andrea Gelsinger. Oh, uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Congratulations. And Carolyn Nigren, is Carolyn still on the, yes, I see she still is on the call. So Carolyn, you've won. And then for the people who win the chocolates is Mary Greenwood, who's there with her dog, isn't that cute? Mary, congratulations. And Sarah Butts. Sarah. Woo. Congratulations. congratulations. Now, Bill, where, where should they get the chocolates? Can they pick them Healy up? Healy coming to our Bel Air store will be fine. Bill, we, we so appreciate it. Um, and, you know, it, it's programming like this that expands, as I, as I mentioned in the chat, it expands our reach and it really opens up our community. So thank you again, Bill, because it's it's this expansion of our, our arts and crafts and the, the art of fine craft. And you definitely uh, exemplify that in your business. So please continue to support William Dean Chocolate uh, and Bill's business as he is, is so generous in supporting um, us. And, uh, and we really appreciate you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.